Amen. So today we're in the I Am series, and uh, we're in week five of that series, and we're looking at the various I Am statements of Jesus. And when I say the I Am statements, we go back to Exodus in the first week where um, God declared himself in his name, his unique name to Moses at the burning bush, and he called himself Yahweh. I am that I am. And, and we looked at the fact that he is eternal. He is now. He is absolute. He is unchanging. He is ultimate. He is God. Amen? Amen. And then Jesus came and in the midst of a conversation with some Pharisees, he took the divine name, the I am. And he gave us the Greek equivalent, which is ego I me. And he said, before Abraham was even born, I am. And he showed that he was outside of time and that he was ultimate God. And then Jesus didn't stop there with that I am statement. He, he made several I am statements in the book of John in order to declare and explain to us what the invisible God is like. Because God wants you to know him, amen? amen. He wants to reveal himself to you. And so today is one of the I am statements. It's I am the resurrection and the life. And this I am statement is made by Jesus right, right while he is giving the greatest miracle of all time. Aside from his own resurrection, he raises Lazarus from the dead. Now, some of you guys know this story, and I just need you to do something for me. If you grew up in Sunday school or in church, and you're, you're listening to this, and you're like, yeah, I've heard that story about a million times. Just pray a quick prayer to God in your heart. Lord, give me a clean slate right now. Lord, give me great expectation that you're going to show me new things that I need to learn today. Can you pray that? It matters. We're going to go into John chapter 11. Now, this is right on the heels of what we talked about last week. Remember the man born blind and Jesus healed him. And then Jesus told us all about the good shepherd and that he was the good shepherd. So this is the chapter right after that. Verse one, a man named Lazarus was sick and he lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. Just a couple things I want to pull out of there. Number one, he's sick. He might die. So they send Jesus a letter. Think of it like a prayer request. And what do they say in it? They don't say he's given this much money to the offering. They don't say he served in the nursery this long. They say, Jesus, you love this guy. Letting you know he's sick. It's a good letter, amen? Simple and to the point. The other thing I want you to notice is that they're named here, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Now that's significant because if you think through a lot of the different uh, passages in, in the gospels where Jesus does miracles, we don't often get their names. Even the man bor born blind two chapters ago, we didn't get his name or the name of his parents but we get their names. Why is that? It's an indication, even the letter is this way, they're friends with Jesus. There's relationship here. There's, there's background here. So see it through that lens. Verse four, but when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the son of God will receive glory from this. Now, uh, real quick spoiler. Yes, it is Jesus going to end in death. Lazarus is going to die, if you know the story, not to ruin it for you. He's going to die. Jesus is going to raise him from the dead. Then Lazarus, for an unknown amount of time, is going to live longer. And then he's going to die a physical death again and then get resurrected again. Is your head spinning yet? When Jesus says it will not end in death, Jesus means not ultimately. You're just going to get this from Jesus. Also in verse five, the ESV renders it like this says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. So, so just some facts, because Jesus loved them, he decided to delay. Have you ever prayed for God to do something and to show up and God delayed? And God didn't show up on time. God was late. How'd that make you feel? What's weird about the passage is it says, because he loved them, he delayed. 
because he's got a miracle that he wants to do. Let that mess with your prayer life just a little bit. Verse 11, then he said, and he's speaking to his uh, 12 disciples here, Jesus is, he says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. The disciple said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will soon get better. Now, Jesus is using this, this idea of sleeping to mean spiritual sleep, to mean death. And the disciples think he means physical sleep. That means he's going to get better. There's a misunderstanding here. So verse 14, so Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now, I, now you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. Jesus said, it's way better that we delayed. And for your sakes, it's going to be better. Why is it better for the disciples that Jesus delayed? Because Jesus is about to do a miracle that will take their faith to a whole different level. Yeah. Nobody even thought resurrection was possible. Uh, if, if you know the scripture, you know that there, there was a group called the Sadducees and a group called the Pharisees, and they used to debate and argue all the time about whether or not resurrection was even possible, whether or not resurrection was even God's plan, resurrecting human bodies. Jesus is about to do it in front of them. So it's definitely going to increase their faith. Verse 17, when Jesus arrived at Bethany, so it's a different town, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem. Now that's significant. Many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. And when Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet Jesus and Mary stayed in the house. It's only two miles away from Jerusalem. And what the passage is trying to indicate there is there were a lot of people that had come to be part of this funeral moment with the sisters, this grieving moment with the sisters. Because they were so close to Jerusalem, extended friends and family, possibly even professional mourners had all come from Jerusalem because it wasn't that far. So this is a good sized crowd. Jesus probably knew that. A good audience for this resurrection. Also four days Four days mattered. He'd been in the tomb for four days. Okay, a couple reasons it mattered. Number one, Jesus had raised dead people before, but they had all been recently dead. So one reference is to Jairus' daughter had been resurrected by Jesus, but it was immediately after the daughter's death. And then the widow's son was, re was resurrected within a day of the son's death. Now, why is that a problem? Because somebody could accuse Jesus of simply reviving somebody out of a coma. Or maybe they, it was falsely considered death because you didn't have the medical professionals then that you had today. You didn't have an EK EKG machine to show the real status of their heart. So somebody could come along and say, Jesus didn't raise the dead. This wasn't resurrection. This was just him reviving someone. But after four days, sealed up in a tomb? Yes. No. He'd started to decompose. And we're going to talk about decomposition later, so you can look forward to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> also, he deliberately waited four days. There's a, there's a rabbi... A, Within a century of this uh, text, Ben Kafra, um, he said this. He said, for three days, the spirit hovers about the tomb. If perchance it might return to the body. And, and what he's indicating there is that part of Jewish custom and, and superstition at that time was that when someone died, their spirit kind of hovered around. And so this was their way to explain why sometimes people they thought were dead did sometimes revive. Is they thought the spirit was still up there. And under the right circumstances, maybe it just might re-enter the body and they come back. So Jesus probably knew that and he waits four days. All of this timing matters. Verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. It's a very interesting statement from Martha. She's expressing faith in Jesus' healing ability while simultaneously accusing him. You ever do that? <laughs> ever speak some real Christianese to God that sounds like faith while you simultaneously accuse God? I've done it. If only you had been here. And she's got faith that Jesus could have healed. She doesn't have faith yet 
that Jesus could resurrect. Those are two very different categories in her mind. If only you had been here. What else is she saying? What's really in the background? You know, for days, Jesus, we were by his side weeping. For days, we were feeding him and giving him whatever medications that we, that we knew of and that we could. For days, we were hoping and we were crying and we were yearning and we were watching the road for you to arrive and you never did. Why? I thought you loved him. Why? Didn't you care? It's all in her words. Maybe we promised him that you would arrive in time. We promised him it would be okay. And now those promises sound hollow. Why, Jesus? The pain of unanswered prayers and unanswered hopes. Some of you have been through this. Let's sit here for just a second. I got a nephew, I've told the story before, Beckham, two years old, gets diagnosed with eye cancer. It's called retinoblastoma. I Googled it at the time. What's the survival rate? And instantly I hoped that my sister would never Google the survival rate of retinoblastoma because he wasn't going to make it. Cancer in the eye was too close to certain parts of the brain. It was going to be bad. We were going to lose this little two-year-old nephew of mine. Didn't even know how to pray. He's a teenager today. God healed him. It's an amazing thing. Yeah. Praise God. In the year 2020, what a year, right? In the year 2020, my mom uh, got diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, She had surgery. She had chemo. She went through all of the things. And she's still alive today. God spared her. Had more, more Christmases with her, more birthdays with her, more memories made with her. Praise God for that. What a gift that is. In the same exact year, but five months previous, my dad was also diagnosed with cancer. But he didn't make it. And I prayed just as hard for him. I was close to my dad. You ever wake up the morning after that loved one has passed away? And when you wake up and you open your eyes, what you know, the only thing you know is that the world will never be the same. And I had more to say to him and I had more to do with him and it did not fit my timetable. And I had asked and written my letter to God and Jesus did not come walking up the road for me. And that was tough. Some of you guys been through that tough. Some of you guys been through it enough that you're like, why, why, God, sometimes did you come and sometimes it didn't feel like you came? See, now you're entering into what Martha was feeling in that moment as she spoke with Jesus. Verse 23, Jesus told her, now he's going to give her the truth here. Jesus is going to give the sisters and everybody present there three different gifts. I, now, I, pr- I preach this passage quite a bit for funerals. And here's your three points. If you're ever in a situation, you need to turn this into a sermon. Jesus is going to give them the truth. He's going to give them his tears. And he's going to give them power. Those three things. So here comes the truth. Your brother will rise again, he says. Verse 24. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. She's like, yeah, eventually. I get it, Jesus. Eventually. Jesus told her, you don't understand, Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. I would love to have been there. Watched him say that. Anyone who believes in me will live even after they die. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? 27, yes, Lord. She told him, I have always believed you are the Messiah, the son of God, the one who comes into the world from God. Now she says, yes, I've believed all this. If I could insert this for Martha, I just didn't know it meant resurrection. But she makes a good confession. Now, if you've grown up in the church, you're used to hearing about the good confession of Peter, right? When Jesus goes to him and says, who do people say that I am? And then Peter says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Peter knows. And it's a massive thing. That gets recorded in the three other gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John doesn't record that for us. John records the good confession of Martha. I think that's significant. 
even in the midst of her brokenness and her emotion, she knows who Jesus is. Like, let that sink in for a second because um, sometimes your faith is complicated. I think it's massive. John 5, 26, Jesus said, the father has life in himself and he has granted that some, the same life-giving spirit power to the son. So the, God the father has life in himself. No one gave him life. He has it in himself. And the son has life in himself. What is he saying there? He's saying he is an ultimate source of life. God is the ultimate source of life. So we've said Jesus is the bread of life, right? He is the light of the world. He is the good shepherd. Jesus is the I am that I am. Here he comes again and says, I am the resurrection and the life. Like I am the life. And what's he saying? He's saying, you all got your life through me. And that's real because we can reproduce ourselves as a species, but we do not create and we do not revive the dead to life. Maybe even we clone life, but we do not create life. I was even thinking about the sun. You know, the sun is such a, a, a beautiful picture in our solar system of, of it's the center and, and it's this incredible source of power and life for everything. Every, every green thing, every blade of grass that you see, it's like a, a little solar panel, right? Getting its energy from the sun and being able to grow as a result. They all depend on the sun. And then we started to smarten up as a species and we make solar panels of our own. And get electricity out of it all across the globe. And the sun is big enough, except here's the problem. The sun, scientists tell us, is burning down. It's burning out. Very slowly, you're not going to see it. But it's limited. It was begun and it will end. Why? Because it is not the ultimate source of life. The sun itself was lit by the source of light. See, that's, that's Jesus. And the same, the same one that, that set fire to the sun is the one who's gonna raise Lazarus from the dead. He originated all life. Verse 32, when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. She says the same exact phrase Martha said. You notice the soundbite is the same? It's like the two sisters have been in the back room talking about this for days. Yeah, you've, you've had that feeling before. 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing around her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him, he asked. They told him, Lord, come and see. And then Jesus wept and the people were standing nearby and they said, see how much Jesus loved Lazarus. So, This is Jesus' second gift. So he gave truth and now he gives tears. He gives his emotion. Even the anger that's there is very interesting. Uh, We don't even know based on those Greek words exactly what kind of anger or what the anger is at. It's just there. And I won't try to explain it away to you and take any of the mystery out. The way the Greek, the the Greek is kind of a, a negative stirring was in him, like the stirring of waters. And he's reacting to something. I don't think he's angry at Mary here because he's crying with her tears. I'll just give you my guess. I think he's His anger is at the broken world and the world of death that is around him. And this is what God promised. He said, Emmanuel will come and he will be God with us. And he would walk in our shoes and experience what we experience firsthand. And a God who designed the Garden of Eden and never longed for death to be a part of it is now experiencing death right against him. And he responds with anger. Even on the cross, the scripture says that Christ despised the shame. He's got emotions, okay? So he's angry at this, and then he weeps with her. Why? He's about to raise Lazarus from the dead in a matter of minutes. Why weep? Because she's weeping. Isn't he philosophically, supernaturally above all of this? 
she's weeping, so he weeps with her. Um, if you're a parent, Linda and I are parents. We, we've raised three teenagers into adulthood, mostly. Um, and thank God for that. And when you go through that, when you, when you do that, and you take that role, uh, one of the things that you experience is puppy love. Ever, ever see puppy love before? It's really beautiful and fun. Um, but there can be um, infatuation that becomes so strong that when that crush gets crushed, it's super painful. And they can be devastated. But what's interesting, when you're the parent that's trying to comfort and trying to be there with them in this crushing there's a part of you that knows this is small. But even though I know this is small. And once you live some more decades, it will get smaller and smaller and smaller. Even though you know that, you don't say, cheer up. You're not flippant about their feelings. You respect their feelings. That's empathy. You enter in. So you weep with them because they're weeping. So the tears are for the crying person. Does that make sense? And that's what Jesus is doing right now. Their life isn't over. Jesus is about to heal Lazarus, but he knows this is the moment that they're in and he cares enough to enter into it with them. Learn some things just really quickly about this delay and, and about your prayer life. And I'm just gonna make this very, very brief for you. But the delay of Jesus for Mary and Martha did not equal that he was disinterested in them. And so when God delays the answers to your prayers, it does not equal his disinterest in you. Amen? Jesus sees you. Every second, he's not somewhere else paying attention to somebody else. He hears you and he sees you. Also, delay does not equal disregard. Some of us wonder that. Sometimes it feels like my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. Sometimes it feels like God doesn't hear me. Sometimes it feels like God doesn't see my tears. You've had the feeling, I've had that feeling. Jesus had seen all of it. He had a plan. Don't forget that. And then delay does not equal denial. God will come through in your situation in his time. Amen. In his time. Verse 38. Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone that was rolled across its entrance to seal the body in. Now that's important. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. The King James Version said, he stinketh. <laughs> I love the King James. So, so good. He stinketh, Lord. And she's right. She's right. So uh, we're, I'm going to do a little uh, spot right now. And um, this, this next, I'm going to talk about decomposition for a minute. A little bit of a class. Um, and it's, it's a little bit grisly and gruesome. Um, I'm going to try to hold myself back from the worst parts of it. But I think it's helpful for us to understand what four days of decomposition means and why he stinketh. Amen? Um, it, it's important. So if this is not you and, and you're not so much into this, you just plug your ears and pull out your phone and, and surf the web during church and I'm fine with it. Um, but I, I had to go on to like some mortician websites and like, like try to learn what they learned. So this is not scriptural, uh, this next part. Um, but decomposition, the timing of it matters very much on the manner of death, um, the temperature of the body and the temperature around it. And then the, uh, the, the, the uh, air content um, that is going on. But on the whole... Uh, as soon as blood circulation stops and breathing stops, decomposition begins in a body. Brain cells die after three minutes. Muscle cells all die after several hours. At this point, bacteria enters the body and definitely speeds the process. At 12 hours, the body is cool to the touch, but at 24 hours, it is cold to the core. Rigor mortis sets in after three hours, but it stops at 36 because the muscles will no longer contract. They just are going away. 
Bacteria produces an odor called putrefaction. First responders, you've heard about this. First responders often smell a dead body before they find it. And it's because of this. After three days, the internal organs have completely decomposed. They're gone. The body starts to bloat with gases. I'm not going to go too much further. <laughs> Turns a greenish color. Um, somebody coming along at that point and trying to revive the body, let's shoot some electricity through it. Nope, there's none of that. That's not happening to that body. The cells have completely, the cell walls have all broken down. Um, poor Lazarus is in some bad shape. Amen. Like when she said he stinketh, she was right. It was sealed behind that stone. You did not want to open that thing. Verse 40, let's look at what happens. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. Now, real quick pause. Notice Jesus is saying, Father, I'm praying to you out loud right now, but I don't need to. Because I already prayed in my heart, and Father, you heard my thoughts. Amen. You heard my prayers. Jesus is even saying the ones that he did in the privacy of his own heart, those are the ones that mattered. He's like, I'll say it out loud just for all of you. Jesus actually does this multiple times. I Pulling this out just real quick, because sometimes people will tell you in the church that if you don't pray your prayers out loud to God, they don't have power. They're wrong multiple times in the scripture. Don't start getting weird about whether or not something's in your heart versus out loud. Jesus makes that clear here. So then Jesus shouted, verse 43, Lazarus come out and the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. And Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Amazing. How did we get from, can I say mush? To... Lazarus again. Creator God did that. It's the only way that that happened. There's, there's no reviving that's going on. Uh, and if you keep reading into the next chapter, there's a moment where um, Jesus is, is reclining at the table with Lazarus and the sisters are there and they're just having some time together and the two of them are talking. What I wouldn't give to know what those two guys were talking about at that point. Because now Lazarus knows some things, right? Like he's been to the other side and he's come back. Like what, what, what things in common does he have with Jesus that he never did before? Uh, it goes on to say that the chief priests uh, made a plot now to kill Lazarus, not just Jesus. This is the only reference in the gospels to somebody else who had a, um, uh, who had a plot against them, a warrant out for their death besides Jesus. Why? Because... The evidence is walking around and everybody knew he'd been in a tomb for four days. I mean, this is stubborn disbelief, but instead of the priests deciding to believe in Jesus, they're like, we got to kill the evidence. <laughs> That's some hard stuff, man. Yeah. John 5, 28. This one's not on your screens. Jesus says this, don't be surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their grace will hear the voice of God's son and they will rise again. And what Jesus is saying there is not just Lazarus heard the voice of Jesus. You will hear the voice of Jesus. Someday your body, whatever state it's in, will somehow without physical ears, it will hear the voice of Jesus call us to resurrection Amen. and you will be resurrected. And Jesus makes that promise right there in that verse. So this is for you. There's different parts of this passage today, but for the most part, this is for you. See, resurrection, you've been called out that you will be resurrected. And the fact that you'll be resurrected needs to change your life now. It should change your calculations. It should change your faith. It should change everything for you. Uh, there's a musician wrote a song. Wes King said, there's a little Lazarus in all of us. There's a little Lazarus in all of us. Um, 
If Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and if you're a Christian today, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, then that makes you Easter people. It makes you resurrection people every single day. How do, you, how do you be a resurrection person? I got three different ways you can be a resurrection person. The very first way is to see resurrection even though you never have. To start to see it in your mind's eye even though you've not seen resurrection up close yet. Because in a sense, all of us sitting in this room, we're like the sisters the day before. You're like, well, I struggle to believe in resurrection. It's only because you haven't seen it yet. That's the only reason. If you saw it, you'd believe in it. Because I don't think they struggled with their faith in resurrection the day after. See things with eyes of faith that God has told you is true. Even if you've never seen it before, is resurrection credible? Is it plausible? Is it believable? Scientists have this way of saying, you can't believe something. Something isn't true unless we've seen it unless we've recreated it in a, you know, a scientific method kind of situation where we can observe the phenomenon. And we can say, yes, we all agree that it's real. We've got proof and all that kind of stuff. The problem with that is timing. Scientists can only believe in things that exist right now in front of them. That's right. What about future things? What about like warp drives and Klingons, Right. Like you don't have evidence for that yet, yet, <laughs> Joke, joking, um, self-driving cars, not plausible until they are, computers that used to fit in whole rooms and now fit in the palm of your hand, not plausible, but now they are, what's the difference, the date, that's the difference, and so Jesus had come and said, this thing is going to happen. This thing has happened. Do you believe it? With eyes of faith, that's what we're called to. What are we called to? We're called to believe that the same, and, and this is just, this is logical consistency. We're called to believe that the same God who created Ad, Adam out of the dust of the ground could raise Lazarus. So go back to Genesis. And the scripture says that God took particles matter from the dust of the ground and somehow turned dust particles and matter into flesh. And then he breathed the divine breath into them and man became a living soul. Like that's what the scripture says. So if God can turn dust into you, why can't he take mush in the book of John and turn it into Lazarus? Amen. One cell at a time because he's the creator God. All I'm calling you to is a faith consistency and a logic consistency between what you believe in Genesis and what you believe in John. Amen. And if you can believe those two things, then you can believe Revelation and 2 Thessalonians that talk about the fact that all of you will also be resurrected. The creator God will do it in his way. Well, how will he do it? I don't know. He'll do it. Right? Like, like, what if some of us get cremated and what if a sailor falls over the edge, edge of a ship and 20 different fish eat him and they all swim in different directions? It's a gruesome Sunday, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> How in the world will God reconstitute that body at the resurrection? That's his problem. Amen. He's the creator God. Genesis, John, Revelation. Be consistent. It is positive. See it by eyes of faith where you've not seen it before. Are we people of faith or aren't we? Next, move your bookends. Um, people like to say things like, this life is all there is. You only have one life to live. You get 80 years and then you're done. 80 years and then it's over. You better get it done now. You better enjoy this life while you've got it because then that's it. And then that's how we live. It gets into our talk. It gets into the way we, th we think, the way we make decisions, our priorities, things like that. So I've got a little illustration here for you. So I've got some bookends. That's Winnie the Pooh. And that's your childhood. 
And when you're in that, that's all there is. It's all that matters. Everything is right there. And then you, you start to have your teenage years. Get this right. Right? You, you read a little bit more. You experience a little bit more. But man, while you're in high school, man, everything's high school. Ten years later, we, we can't believe we used to believe that because everything that matters is right now. Amen. It depends on the decade that you're in. And then maybe God blesses you with more decades and more years. Elijah, can you come up the stage? And you got a whole life. Give a hand to Elijah, would you? <laughs> In the view of the world, this is all of you. This is all that you are. You get those 80 years, you get those 90 years, and then you're done. We call things terminal. You know what terminal means? The end. We say that pain is terminal. This cancer is terminal. We use phrases like that. We got to remove those phrases. Amen. It's not terminal because that's not the end of me. This isn't all me. So if you would, sir, take that and start moving it that way. Maybe right here. What happens 180 years into eternity when Jesus has raised you from the dead and you've experienced heaven in the presence of God in your whole new life? How does that look now? Your cancer back here starts to look a lot different. The timing of when your family entered glory starts to look a whole lot different. Amen. A lot of things start to look different. Can you keep going? Still looks different. How about all the way to the wall over there? Let's go. Right on, Elijah. Um, <laughs> When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining is the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise. Right? Right? Now go ahead and leave the door and just keep going for a few blocks. I'm joking. I'm joking. You don't have to do that. Come on back. Give him a hand, would you? Thanks, man. Appreciate it. The question is, what are you? What's the essence of you? Your identity. See, in God's mind, in Jesus' mind, realize he's constantly looking at you as an eternal being. You are immortal. You are indestructible as a soul who he will rebuild as a new body. Like I'm giving you heavy theology here, but this is what the Bible says. And so when God looks at the essence of you and who you are and who you will be, do you realize he sees all of it? And man, we get really worked up about some of this stuff. Yep. And he also enters in and cries with us because he doesn't disrespect us and he's not flipping about how we feel, is he? No, it matters. Next thing we got to do is we got to take the power out of permanence. Stop using words like terminal, guys. Yes, wow. A year ago, I went to the eye doctor, and I'm starting to wear glasses. And they said, this is what happens to people your age. Ugh, thanks a lot. You'll wear these for the rest of your life. No, I won't. I'm not trying to be dumb Christian here. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to be silly. I'm not trying to say you got to go and say this to everybody else, but change the way that you think. Amen. Maybe I'll wear glasses for 30 years and then I get a new body. Hallelujah. Right? Like that starts to change things. Uh, my uncle, a mortician, he died last year and I got to do his funeral for him. Loved my uncle, Doug Snell. And um, he was a mortician all of his adult life and people would come in and he would say, you know what the first three letters of funeral are, don't you? God, you're slower than first service was. <laughs> He's just a silly, goofy guy. Uh, wonderful guy. Wonderful, compassionate heart. He got Alzheimer's. Spent the last 10, 15 years of his life with Alzheimer's. Tough. But that's not who he is. It's a, it's a terminal. No, it's not terminal. 
It's a permanent. No, it's not permanent. Change how you talk. Linda had a friend in college and she was deaf and she was progressively losing her eyesight. And people would talk with such tragedy in their voices. Everything is going to go dark for her. And she won't be able to hear and she won't be able to see. It'll just be darkness. In glory, she will get sight. In glory, she will see beauty and the face of God. And she will see an array of colors you've never seen before. Because your physical eyes on earth are not capable of seeing them. And when she looks back after that experience, how will she see it? Do you see that future you is just going to see everything just massively different? We got to get permanent out of our speech. Okay, it's a lot of truth. Pray it changes us. But let's end on the compassion of Jesus because it's important. Jesus wept with them. In the midst of all of that, he wept with them because their feelings mattered. And God weeps with us. And many of us are in a tough place. A lot of tears after first service today. Um, There's a moment, C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors, when he was 12 years old, his mother died of cancer, 1908. And his father couldn't handle it. His father sent him off to a boarding school so he could go mourn alone because dad couldn't explain it. And so he struggled with that, wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, if you know Lewis. And in one of those Chronicles of Narnia, the magician's nephew is the book. He creates a character called Diggory. And Diggory has a mom and he's nine years old and the mom is dying of a disease. And he's all broken up about it. Um, And so... Diggory has this moment where he comes in contact with the the lion Aslan. And if you know the story, uh, Aslan, the lion, is the stand-in for Jesus. And Diggory goes on this adventure and he's trying to get this this magic apple. And he wants to take it back to earth in order to uh, rescue his mom and cure his mom. And, And that's his whole motive all throughout the thing. He comes to this spot and he realizes he can't take it back to his mom. And in despair, he goes to the lion and he starts talking to the lion. And he says things like, "Um, please, Mr. Lion Aslan, sir, could you, may I, please, will you give me more magic fruit to make my mother well and Aslan just looks at him and and this is what it says. Up till then, he had been looking at the lion's great feet and the huge claws on them. Now in his despair, he looked up at its face and when he, what he saw surprised him as much as anything in his whole life. For the tawny face was bent down right near his own and great shining tears stood in the lion's eyes. They were such big bright tears compared with Diggory's own that for a moment he felt as if the lion must really be sorrier, sorrier about his mom than he was himself. And Lewis is just stealing from Jesus and Lazarus here. A God who weeps, we sung it in the worship song earlier. He's a God who weeps, massive for us. Would you guys stand? Mm. We're gonna pray. We're gonna pray that we would be resurrection people. Jesus, we give you praise and glory because you are the resurrection and the life. Thank you, Lord, that you came and you proved yourself, Lord, not only raising Lazarus from the dead, Lord, but raising yourself from the dead after you died for our sins. Lord, I pray that, God, that you would come into our life, God, and where we claim to be a Christian, but we're not living like one. Lord, would you start to shape us again? Lord, help us to surrender our thoughts and our words to you. Make us into those resurrection people. Thank you for these promises, Lord. They bring so much healing to us. And God, for those in the room, those even online, God, right now, that are right in the midst of a painful season, God, with loss. Jesus, I pray that they would know your presence with them now. They would be comforted 
by your love for them in Christ's name.